Today, we're talking to Tanya LaPointe, director and producer of The Paper Man. It is part of the Made in Canada series presented by Canadian Cinema Editors, and it was also the winner of the Audience Award at the Whistler Film Festival. You can stream it, along with every other film, part of this festival at northwestfest.ca. Tanya, it's a real pleasure talking to you about this documentary, and uh, it's about somebody who has probably had a deep cultural impact, uh, particularly in Quebec, and probably for many people across the country, but more regionalized in Quebec. So we're looking at a five-year career, uh, five-decade, pardon me, career of Claude Lapointe, who was a quad la fortune, who was a staple of French-Canadian television, inspiring generations of children through his celebration of creativity, inclusivity, and diversity. And even though we lost him in April, his spirit is alive in this film and his creations and in the people he inspired. So can you give the audience a little bit of some background about Claude for anyone that's unfamiliar with his work? Well, um, in, in the province of Quebec, or even I, I grew up in Ontario, but, you know, growing up in, with the French language, I, I, woke, I watched uh, Radio-Canada, and that's where Claude Lafortune uh, aired all of his programming. And even before I was born, he was already a staple of, of uh, French-Canadian television. And what was fascinating uh, was sitting, you know, I remember my mom saying, don't so, sit so close to the TV, but that's what I did because I wanted to be close to the television to see how he made these wonderful paper sculptures. And it seemed easy, you know, he'd take pieces of uh, paper, scissors, and within 10 seconds, he'd made a sheep or, you know, he would make a, a, a character, full, you know, 3D character uh, in front of our eyes. And so I, that fascinated me and it uh, developed, I think, my creativity when I was a, a child. Um, and I think that's the impact he's had on a lot of even art, people who have become artists today. Because the, the wonderful thing of having the movie come out now is to have all of these people say, oh, I was also influenced by him. So was I in different ways. Um, and a lot of people have said, even though they didn't go on to become paper artists, um, they became artists being inspired by um, this empowerment, I think, that Claude gave children saying, you too can make art with whatever you find at home. Yeah, and, and you just referenced this idea of you and so many others growing up uh, watching Claude. And, uh, and you even had those few times to interview him um, when you were working in a different career uh, before you even started thinking about doing this documentary, I assume. You know, I think your film really articulates what Claude meant to you and to several generations of people. But can you kind of give us your feelings about what made Claude a little bit more, uh, some more detail about it, about his work and, and why it resonated with you uh, beyond just even your childhood? Mm -hmm. And I think that was the most important thing. I didn't want to make a film uh, that was solely based on nostalgia. Uh, of course, there were the archives, but I wanted people to understand that this was a a person that was very much um, passionate about his work, even into his 80s, because uh, as you said, you know, I, I, I watched him when I was a child and I was a reporter, interviewed him, and that's how that first connection happened. But then when I'm, he contacted me on Facebook in um, 2018, he was 81 by then, and he wrote me saying, hi, Tanya, you know, remember me? And I'm like, of course I remember you. Uh, and he was telling me that he was preparing a new exhibit. And I thought, wow, 81. 81 and still passionate about what he does and so that allowed me to um, open that door to make a documentary and to get to know Claude beyond you know the TV uh, TV shows for for children and for me the comparison with Fred Rogers for example in the United States um, really uh, is a is a good one because Fred Rogers if you've seen the documentary or even the biopic with Tom Hanks you notice that beyond what he did or what seemed like you know child's play on TV had deep roots and had a true foundation. And I think Claude Lafortune had that too. Um, he was someone who had very good values and he had a, a TV show called, uh, you know, loosely translated, it means uh, parcels of sunshine, uh, in which he invited children who had disabilities, illnesses, who came from different parts of the world. And he spoke to them about how they were different. And he spoke to them in a way to celebrate their differences. And that was, you know, avant-garde at that time. This was from the 1988 to 2000, but there's something so uh, profoundly generous about what he did. So I, I think that his values, his personal values were um, central to who he was and what he did. And then beyond that, the other theme that I really wanted to touch upon in the film um, is the fact that even though he had been celebrated as a 
kids TV show host, uh, he was never called an artist. Uh, people would say, oh, you know, it's arts and crafts and sort of, you know, looked, looked at him like not taking his, his work seriously. And when I met him again in, in, uh, in 2018, I realized just how he had refined his art because when he was on TV, he was always, you know, on a deadline with, you know, he was doing these 15, 20 minute TV shows. And now he had all the time in the world to develop. And so he would make these these large, I mean, some of them were three feet high, made completely out of paper and so very elaborate and not just the re uh, re reproduction of, you know, uh, Be Beethoven or whoever it was that he was making a portrait of, um, but giving them a soul and giving them an, interpre an interpretation. So ultimately, you know, the film is about being a better person. The film is also asking a, a broader question, which is, you know, what is art and who decides what is art? And, you know, that's a question that people can answer after they've watched the film. You know, it's interesting that you say that there is a certain uh, level of refinement in his work in maybe the later years when he wasn't necessarily having to cater it towards a much younger audience or maybe wasn't on a deadline necessarily. Um, but I mean, I don't know. I mean, for me, I didn't get that impression necessarily. I was just in awe of everything from beginning to the end <laughs> because it just, it seemed like everything was imbued with this magic that he had, you know? And, and that kind of leads us to these two incredibly powerful elements of the film that you have is the archival footage, uh, what you've talked about in some other interviews of, of how to recover that and show clothes work as, uh, as much more than simply paper figures, as well as the actual physical work that he did that he's in museum pieces so you can talk about a little bit about the level of expertise and the kind of magic it took to create the paper world that he surrounded himself and other people with um you mean in making the, the documentary and finding all those pieces yeah 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 well definitely i think it needed to i needed to strike a balance between um showing what he did early on and to show that there was a definite signature in what he did um there was you know, you would see these beautiful uh, creations and you would say, that's Claude Fortune. You know, it, there was no doubt about it because the way he made those faces, the noses, there was very, something very distinctive. Um, and so for me, it was important to go back and find all of those, arch the, all the archi archive footage, sorry. Um, he also did uh, paper uh, sets for a NFB film, which is just, you know, again, mind blowing. So I wanted to show the scope uh, of his work because he was truly, I mean, he even said, it's not in the documentary, but he said at one point um, to a reporter, I wish I could become, this was in the seventies, I wish I could become the Walt Disney of paper. He wanted to create studios and to build, you know, a, a, a complete um, empire in a way. Um, so that was one part was, you know, digging up all the archives and not only digging up the archives, but getting the authorizations from these kids who were invited to his TV show. Uh, and then later on, it was, it was a gift actually that his artwork had been selected by uh, a museum here in Quebec. Um, Jean-Francois Royal had such vision because Claude had knocked on so many doors, um, hoping to get exhibits within museums, within organizations, and everyone said, we love what you do, but eh, it doesn't you know, fit our mandate. But Jean-Francois Royal was really uh, the first one to say, no, this is, there's something here. We need to, uh, we need to protect this heritage that, that he has given us because most of what he did when in the 70s, 80s, and even 90s was, was destroyed. Um, so it was a gift to be able to dig through those archives and um, these living archives in, within these museums to be able to see these sculptures still alive and well. And, and many of those sculptures are still at the museum in Nicolet uh, and they're being featured until 2022. So, you know, even though in the documentary, Claude Affortson says, I don't want to be immortal. Well, I have bad news for him because <laughs> we, we've made his, uh, his art with those museum exhibits, um, you know, withstand time, hopefully for, for a while. Yeah, and, and certainly with this film as well, uh, I would say, you know, I found that the the moments that you shot uh, detailing clothes work to be kind of hypnotic and, and transportational. You know, what were the discussions between yourself and your DP, uh, Hugo de Fauprou, 
who you worked with on another documentary as well, 5050, the documentary, about how you planned on bringing that kind of magic to the screen that you felt not only as a child, but in revisiting that as an adult uh, with him in the room. I think it's, we, we discussed it. And, you know, one thing we wanted to feel is how we felt when we were in the presence of these sculptures. And that feeling is to want to stick your nose right next to them to see the infinite details. And it's to touch it. And obviously you can't do that when you, you know, you're looking at a screen, but how do you replicate that? How do you give that sense of, of feeling, of texture is the, is the proper word. And so when we discussed that, we've, we've realized that, that one of the things is that we needed to shoot with a macro lens. So we needed to be very close. And we also used uh, rails um, or tracks to create a sense of dimension. So that allowed the camera to move and so that we could sort of feel like we're seeing the, the, the sculpture like in, in, tr in 3D because we were traveling around it. Um, and so that was really important to get that sense of um, immersion, you know, to dive into this world and to understand that, you know, obviously he was using at some point like even tweezers because even the details in the eyes are these miniature little bits of pe paper. Um, so I think that was a lot of that conversation. But one of the things that was really important to me as well is to make it feel alive and current. I didn't want something static because I felt that at 81 and 83 when Claude passed away, he still was so vibrant. And I wanted to feel that dynamism, uh, I don't know how to translate that in English, uh, that, that energy, that energy onto the screen. So I think those are the two major conversations that we, we had was how do we shoot the artwork and how do we shoot Claude in a way that we're honoring the work, but that we're also um, communicating the energy that we were all feeling when we were with Claude. Was there ever a burden in this work and making this film to make sure that you represented Claude the way you wanted to? Or did it seem kind of effortless because of just the person he was to so many, including yourself? Um, that's a good question. I think in terms of, of the form, of the content, of the shooting, everything was just a gift. Claude was generous. He loved being in front of the, t of the, of the camera and he was playful and the people we meet were also very generous. Um, finding the archives was, was fun to try to dig out these little pieces here and there from the 70s and, and so on. Um, the, the most difficult part was, you know, financing because um, since Claude had been overlooked when I, you know, brought this project to different institutions, they didn't find any interest in it. They were like, meh, you know, and I, I believed in it. And so that was the hardest part was finding, you know, the, the, the funds to make this film. Um, and the hardest part, honestly, uh, was when Claude Lafortune passed away in April of uh, 2020, because at that point I hadn't finished shooting. Um, I was planning on filming with him in, in June, so just a few months later, because there would, we were, what was scheduled was um, a grand finale to uh, these school workshops he had done with kids, and I could imagine the scene, him surrounded with the kids, the paper sculptures, then the pandemic hit. Uh, Claude was already uh, weak, and so he died of COVID. And so you can't imagine what it's like watching over 30 hours of footage of someone who's become my friend, watching these beautiful moments, and he had just passed away. And for me, I never questioned, you know, should I wait? I instead felt an urgency to tell this story because I felt that Claude Lafortune brought something that we need in, in that moment. We, you know, is it it's still, I mean, we're still going through it now, but I don't know. I felt that, um, that Claude had a message uh, and values that people would appreciate, you know, during this time. So, um, but I would say that's the hardest thing because it was, it was, um, it was at times heartbreaking, of course, to, to, to see that all of what he was, had, was gone but then there was the great responsibility. Uh, and, and also, I would say, you know, obviously now I can say I'm very happy that I got the opportunity to be with him for those two years and to share this with the world. Yeah, and as an audience member who was watching it and really didn't have a lot of context for who Claude was, 
um, I feel like you did an incredible job at, you know, trans transporting me into that time uh, when he was creating that, those television shows, um, making him look the, 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 like the kind of icon that he should have been of television at that point in time. You do a fantastic job of translating just how, you know, beautiful and articulated his art uh, was and just how vibrant he was as a creative force, even later on in his life, even though maybe uh, there wasn't quite as much, you know, of a focus uh, pop culturally on what he was doing. Um, but you definitely have kept the legacy of him intact and, and exposed brand new audiences to what he did. And, uh, and hopefully that'll carry on forever. Yeah, well, thank you. And and that's what I'm most proud of. And I, I, I think a, a little bit surprised because I figured that audiences in the province of Quebec or francophones from across Canada would be interested in this. But I think Claude Lafortin is truly, or he has proven that he transcends borders, he transcends even generations, because um, young kids, I, I've been told, are watching the documentary and are fascinated by his work. So it just feels like it's, um, he just keeps on giving, even, you know, even though he's not with us anymore. So I, I'm very grateful that the, the movie is, is connecting with so many people. Absolutely. We're speaking with Tanya Lapointe, director, producer of the film, The Paper Man. It's part of the Made in Canada series, which is presented by the Canadian Cinema Editors. It was also the winner of the Audience Award at the Whistler Film Festival, and maybe it'll win one at this festival. Oh. You never know. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have any inside uh, information for you, Tanya, but you never know. I would love, I would love it. <laughs> you can stream it along with every other film at, of course, northwestfest.ca. Tanya, thank you so much for your time, and especially thank you so much for the film. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm grateful.